Well, welcome everybody. Uh, looks like we have uh, about 60, 60, 82 people on at the moment, and I'm sure we'll have a few more in the next, uh, in the next few minutes. So my name is Jana Hexter. I work with the Northeastern IPM Center. We're based at Cornell, but we serve the entire Northeast. And welcome to this uh, part three of our tick IPM webinar series. And today we're focusing on Asian longhorned tick IPM. And we have with us Dina Fonseca and Matt Bickerton. So welcome. And um, so if we could move to the next slide. Great. So a recording of this webinar will be available. It takes about a week because we do some editing on it before we post it. Uh, the link is here, but you don't need to uh, scurry to write it down because um, if you are registered for this webinar, um, you will get a recording. So you'll get an email from me sometime next week um, with a copy to the link to the recording. Um, next slide, please. And uh, this is designed to be interactive. We have uh, scheduled it so there's uh, breaks all the way through to answer your questions. And um, what we like to use is the Q&A feature rather than the chat feature. So if you scroll your mouse over uh, your screen where you're watching um, this um, uh, PowerPoint, you'll see that there's a box that says Q&A and it's probably in the, either in the top bar or the bottom bar. On my screen, it's on the right hand side. There's like two little boxes together and it says Q&A. If you click on that, um, you'll be able to type in your questions and you can also do so anonymously. So if you don't want to know who's asked, if you don't want us to know who's asking a question, you can put it in anonymously. And then when we um, have a break for uh, questions, I'll scroll through and, um, and ask the question. We do it this way rather than the chat because on very busy webinars, it's really hard for us to keep track of the chat. And with Q&A, we can see if there are three people that ask the similar question, we can ask it once and then marked it, all three is answered. And so it helps us keep track of which questions have been answered and uh, hopefully do a, a great job of answering you know, as many questions as we can in the time. This is scheduled for an hour and a half, so we'll complete at 12.30 Eastern time. And uh, next slide, please. All right, so it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Dina Fonseca and, uh, and Matt Bickerton. And Dr. Fonseca is a professor in the Department of Entomology at Rutgers University and a man member of the graduate programs in entomology, ecology, and evolution and applied microbiology. She's the director of the Rutgers Center for Vector Biology, and she uses DNA tools to reveal incipient infestations of potentially invasive species, identify which traits are associated with expansion and uh, damage of invasive species in order to optimize management strategies. Um, she also co-developed the New, York, uh, New Jersey Tick Blitz uh, with funding from uh, the Northeastern IPM Center. Uh, Matt Bickerton is the public health entomologist for Bergen County, New Jersey, where he manages tick and mosquito surveillance and control efforts. Um, he's also a PhD student studying entomology at Rutgers and the Center for Vector Biology. He's looking at tick populations, particularly the, invas uh, the invasive Asian longhorn tick and the black legged tick that transmit Lyme and other pathogens. And his research interests involve finding strategies to control these pests in public areas. So you have two experts in their field and uh, conducting active research, which I'm sure they'll share quite a bit with you today. So um, before we dive into the presentation, we have some questions for you. And um, it's for us to get a, and for the presenters to get a good sense of who is on the call and um, what the, uh, your areas of interest or your level of expertise are so that we can uh, guide the conversation um, and understand, um, um, understand your level of experience. So there are no right answers. There's no wrong answers. There's just your answer. It's totally fine. It's not a test. <laughs> it's simply a survey. So you'll see up on your screen, you should um, see a, a poll and um, you can just click on whichever is most relevant to you. And um, I'll give you a couple of minutes to do that and, um, and it will help us to, um, to understand who's on the call today. So as you can see, most people consider themselves um, moderately uh, knowledgeable or somewhat knowledgeable, um, not at all knowledgeable about um, surveillance of, long Asian, uh, of uh, Asian longhorn ticks. So you're in the right place. 
um, not at all knowledgeable about uh, the risk to livestock um, or to pets um, um, or the public health risks. So actually, this is perfect. Um, and um, and uh, about tick management is also not at all knowledgeable. So we have a lot of people who um, this is going to be new information to them. And and um, so probably because there's not a lot out there being shared, maybe. So with that, I am going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Fonseca. Um, Diana, can you turn off or do I turn off the poll? Um, it should it should have gone. No, I can still see it. So I'm just going to um, turn it on. You off. might have to close it out on your screen. Okay. Yeah. Done. All right. Okay. Hi, everyone. I can't see you, but I'm hoping you can hear me. Um, I'm trying to make my screen as big as I can while still being able to um, control the sharing. So hi, I'm, I'm Dina Fonseca. Um, both Matt and I um, actually have a longer, although um, Matt is, is uh, actually both Matt and I have a, a very similar sized uh, um, experience with control of mosquitoes. And uh, working on ticks is actually relatively new to us. Um, and so we actually, for those of you in there that uh, are mostly interested or have worked more on, on mosquitoes, and now are realizing the importance of controlling ticks, we hear you. Um, and, uh, um, and it's sometimes, very enlightening to make the comparison between ticks and mosquitoes and sometimes can be a little disconcerting. Um, so for me, uh, especially, I had just started working on ticks a few years before when suddenly this exotic tick sort of showed up in our lap in, in New Jersey and, and it created a lot of stirring in the, in, the, in the news, in the media, because this is, and I will be talking about more, uh, is a parthenogenetic tick. So quote unquote, it can clone itself. Um, this last, the last message, the self-cloning tick that is terrorizing more states, um, sort of resonated. And um, the reason I actually asked Jaina um, how much, if we should be part of this Northeast IPM for um, just focusing on Asian longhorn ticks, a tick that we still don't know that much about in terms of, you know, detailed IPM is because it may actually affect the IPM you're doing for other ticks. And so that's part of the, the discussion we wanted to have. Uh, so the short outline of what are we going to be doing today, mostly I'm going to be talking about just very shortly about invasive ticks in general, you know, exotics, by the way, there's lots of jokes about ways of playing around with the word tick. Um, so exotic ticks, invasive ticks versus native invaders, which we'll talk a little bit more. And then this concept that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure in the context of invasive ticks. Then I will give a background on the Asian longhorn tick it's discovery, biology, behavior, vector potential, and I'll turn it over to Matt, which has been actively developing strategies for ALT, the Asian longhorn tick management, both in agriculture, livestock, pets, and in this case, primarily in public health. And then we'll have a short slide on to sort of take home messages. So the invasive process, this is taken from Blackburn et al. Um, the, the invasive process, the concept of what, what exactly makes a, a species become invaded, invasive, um, so it has all these different steps. You have uh, the transport of the species, um, and then you have, this is a very broad um, graph that, uh, that includes, you know, plants. Very often plants come in by, by um, cultivation, and also you can have a lot of uh, um, exotic animals come in in captivity. But you can bypass all of that um, and have it come in directly without any sort of direct on purpose human intervention. Um, although vast, vast majority of these species come in through human transport. And then you, they become established uh, or not. In all these cases, you may have a quick failure, uh, but you have, if you have, especially in the Northeast, and this is geared primarily to the Northeast, um, which is why sort of a slight modification, if you have an overwinter survival, since the, the winter is here, kind of a, the big equalizer or the big, um, the big threshold that a lot of species have to overcome, if they become established, then they may spread. And in, in the idea that an invasive species um, sort of comes in with this idea that it spreads, and it may spread on its own, and very often it spreads, again, in, the, in context with human transport. Um, and so this, these... Um, these, all these stages have to be overcome by a species before it becomes actually um, a, an invader. 
And in fact, I, when I put together this slide the first time with the Asian longhorn tick, this was in December of 2017, where we actually weren't yet sure if it was going to be able to survive the winter. And that was part of the reason I put this together. Um, fortunately, in April of 2018, we found out that it had overwintered and in fact was quite well established. So, and then, so this is specifically for the Northeastern US. Um, it came up with a base loosely on Heath uh, 2013 systematic and applied ecology uh, manuscript, come up with a five step approach to assess the risk of a, of a, of a species, particularly a tick species. First of all, um, all invasive ticks seem to have a broad host range, in particular cattle, horses, sort of livestock in general, or pets in general, dogs, cats, iguanas, um, all sorts of things that come in with people may bring ectoparasites with them. Then um, if it has already spread outside its native range, and especially if it is adapted to anthropogenic environments, a human environment, either homes or um, actually associated with our pets, etc. cetera. Um, also a step three, if it's already been detected, intercepted in the US, so meaning it's not yet established, but it has been detected, that increases its risk of the likelihood that it would actually could become an invasive. Finally, and actually not finally, there's one five, fifth step, but a fourth step, is it dangerous? Is it capable of reaching high numbers and spreading? Or is it a vector of damaging pathogens? And finally, is the distribution in the US dependent on environmental association? So if it's gonna be introduced in, in if it's an indoor um, tick, um, and it can be introduced indoors, then basically it can spread across the entire United States. We all have homes across the, the entire area. Uh, if it's cold hardy, then it could spread into the Northeast. But in, instead, if it's tropical, it most likely would stay restricted um, into the Southern United States. Although we are gonna be talking a little bit about how that is sort of spreading North. So those are the five steps sort of came up with. And so I took a look at uh, what are the sort of potential exotics, the potential invasive ticks that could come and become an issue for the Northeastern US. And this is broadly uh, taken from the, this book, Non-Native and Invasive Ticks um, that be, by Michael Burridge, um, which is actually quite, a, quite an interesting read. So what are the exotics in US? Well, interestingly, and to be honest, I was, there really are less than I expected and more than I expected because I hadn't really thought about exotic ticks very much, about invasive ticks before uh, the Asian longhorn kind of came knocking. But the fact is we've had two invasive ticks in the United States for a long time and it's been quite dangerous um, and there's been a lot of effort being done to control the two cattle ticks, um, Ripicephalus, uh, Ripicephalus annulatus and Ripicephalus micropolis. Um, they've been around for a long time. One is from the Middle East Mediterranean area. The other one is from India, Indonesia. Uh, they're both one host ticks. They, they focus on cattle. Um, yes, they've, out, they've, out, they've been outside the native range. Uh, they've detected in the US. They are dangerous. They're vectors of uh, cattle fever. Um, and they've been uh, a big, a lot of effort has been taken to, to control them um, effectively, uh, although they're still, um, sort of incurses into the US, uh, especially of Ripicephalus micro, micro plus more, more recently. Um, so these are sort of the, the standard invasive ticks that don't really affect us up here in the Northeast because they are not um, um, winter capable, surviving the winter here in the, in the Northeast. Um, these are incredibly problematic um, species. But we actually have another invasive species in the US right here, um, Ripicephalus sanguineus, the brown dog tick, originally from Africa, it is thought. It's a three host tick, feeds on, mostly feeds the blood, blood focus on in dogs, and it's an indoor um, species. So um, by the way, if any of you will be, we're actually interested in examining um, more, more specimens of Ripicephalus sanguineus in the Northeast. We've been contacting veterinaries and not having a lot of luck. Um, potentially because it's been quite well controlled or potentially because we're just talking to the wrong people. So um, it's an important vector. Um, it recently in the Southern United States is being found to be an important vector of Rocky Mountain spotted fever, Rickettsia rickettsii, and it has a lot of insecticide resistance. Um, so um, it's a concerning tick. And then, um, so there's the brown dog tick. And then the Mephazilis longicornis showed up, the Asian longhorn tick. Um, 
in some parts of its actually already expanded range in Australia and New Zealand, this is originally a, a tick from temperate Asia, is already called the cattle tick, but, um, and I'll talk about that in a minute, uh, we had to change its name since we've kind of already had the cattle ticks, um, the Ripocephalus annulatus and Microplus. Um, again, it was it had been intercepted before, um, but it was found in 2017 already in a, in a field population, in multiple life stages, and then it was still found uh, after the, the winter in 2018. So, um, as we now know, it's quite well established, broad host range. It, it does have several public concerns in, the, in its native range, and um, we'll talk a little bit more about what are the other concerns. Um, so these are right now the four invasive species of ticks that we know exist in the, in the United States. Um, and so what I'd like to talk about is what are other species that we are concerned about and um, you know, strategies that should be done to try and prevent them. So for example, Amblyoma variegatum, the tropical African bond tick, is a species already being introduced and, and intercepted um, it's a, uh, from Sub-Saharan Africa, it occurs at a broad range of, uh, of hosts and it, it transmits uh, a hurt water, hurt water disease, heart water disease. It's already found in the Caribbean, so it's already outside its native range, so it is a, a species of concern. Cute, very beautiful species, but still problematic, uh, as um, all amblyoma, nice, big, huge mouth parts. Other invasive ticks are others that are actually moving north. And I'm not gonna spend much time talking about this, happy to talk to any of you um, afterwards. <clears throat> These are species that have already been intercepted. Um, we have some of them may actually be south of, in the Southern United States as natives. Um, and these are all species that are of concern um, where although we're not really sure, for example, um, Blioma bratundama is actually another parthenogenetic species and um, Again, these are species that may already be present, but we're not sure. And then we have a, another concept, which are species that are, we know are native in the southern United States, but have become what we're calling native invaders, which are native species that are expanding north due to climate change or adapting to human environments. Amblyoma maculatum was originally just in the southern U.S., and is now found as far north as um, Delaware, and in fact, we collected two of them in the last couple of years in New Jersey. So just two specimens, we're not saying it's established, could have come uh, with um, birds, et cetera, but um, these species are definitely expanding north. And uh, it's a, a vector of tidewater spotted fever, so it is a, um, a problem. This is also actually Rickettsia parkeri um, is a, a public health concern because although it's less pathogenic than Rickettsia rickettsii, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, it does um, generate uh, symptoms in humans. Um, and then we have Exodes affinis, which is sort of coming on the heels of uh, Amblyoma maculatum, um, originally much more southern species, by the way, it does not have a common name. Uh, it's very easily confused with the Exodes capillaris, um, but it has been found as far north now as Virginia. So this primarily health concern is the fact that it is a good vector of, of um, Borrelia burgdorferi, the Lyme disease bacterium, and it would be a really good zoonotic, um, sort of, it could increase, so heat up zoonotic Lyme disease transmission. And finally, other species to sort of keep an eye out for are species that um, are very associated with humans. Uh, the yellow dog tick, originally from Africa, is already uh, across the world, potentially already invasive. It's a do tree host dog, um, tree host tick, uh, primarily on dogs. It's already outside its native range, we think. It's been intercepted in dogs in the US, can transmit Babesia canis, so there is a, a concern for uh, pets. Um, and then we have Ixodes versine as the primary vector of uh, um, Lyme disease in, the, in Europe, which frankly, if it comes here, we will have a lot of trouble finding it just by looking around because they look very much like Ixodes scapularis. It's adapted to anthropogenic environments, it's very likely to bite humans, and finally, Dermacenta reticulatus, the ornate dog tick, um, that again has been found uh, already um, across you know, Eurasia, has been intercepted in U.S. in dogs, transmit Babesia canis, again, an anthropogenically adapted species. So these are all species we are concerned about. 
So in many ways, we should look at the Asian longhorn tick as a bit of a, a wake up call to the potential for other species to arrive. And the fact is that if you can find, detect the species early on in its establishment stages, so you basically have uh, original introduction, it then uh, is commonly the so-called lag phase where a population is sort of just functioning just a very small numbers um, and you, you have this exponential growth where often we're calling it established but basically it's when you you become aware that it's that it's there and then often it can become invasive after it becomes so it has to become invasive after becoming established but this is really where you have the least likelihood of being able to control it so if you have a well-established program of surveillance you may be able to detect these species before they actually become uh, on the on the big increase of in the in the exponential phase where you're much less likely to be able to detect it. So these are the, the, the concern is that if you have, and we, we don't in many cases, we certainly don't have it in the Northeast um, throughout well-established surveillance programs. And in many ways, the Asian longhorn tick was kind of a, an example of how we didn't detect something that was right there for many years. At this point, do you have any questions? And Jaina, follow, help me out here. How am I going to know if there's any questions? I, I will read them to you. We have one question from Carlos Salgado. He says, what are the ID resources available to all those species, um, or those who are already in the US and potentially coming? You mean identification or surveillance? Um, identification. Well, I mean, the... Uh, <laughs> so there are, so for example, uh, Rich Robbins, who's been a wonderful resource to us, it's with a, a Smithsonian, um, it's a, it's a, it's a inter, inter, interaction between USDA and uh, the Smithsonian Institution. Um, it's a, a place where you can, if you have a species that, an individual that you don't know the species, you can send it to him uh, to identif for identification. Um, that's one of the resources we used. Um, we also use uh, in, in the, at the Center for Vector Biology DNA. So we did DNA barcoding. It was actually the first thing that we did to identify something we didn't know what it was. Um, so there's not that much. That's one of the concerns we're having is the lack of uh, uh, developed systematists for to be able to identify invasive species. Um, the good that's the bad news. The good news is that um, th that the need to develop systematists is uh, uh, clear, and also we can use DNA as a um, as a resource. Okay, great. I was going to say maybe uh, Matt can uh, post a link to the resource at the Smithsonian that you uh, that you suggested. Mm -hmm. um, okay, and uh, we have one more question, but I'm going to uh, move right along, and we can ask that question at the next at the next break. So. All right. So I'm going to keep on going. So. The, the, I'm just going to walk you through in many ways, that's kind of the, uh, the answer to the question you just asked me. So what happened in, in terms of the discovery of the Asian longhorn tick is in, in August of 2017, a New Jersey citizen um, that had the owner of Hana, the, the, um, uh, the sheep, um, was was when she went to to um, remove the, the the wool from the sheep became covered in something uh, she wasn't sure what it was um, and so she went to the local um, uh, Department of Health Hunterton County Department of Health with where Tog Rainey um, which is a mosquito specialist I did, looked at the at what turned out to be hundreds of uh, larval ticks and um, said, one, this is a tick, two, this is a larval tick, and three, I don't know what this is. And that is very much to his credit. So he then contacted Jim Osi, which is uh, actually my PhD student and great resource in terms of, he knows a lot of people. And then Jim contacted Rich Robbins, which I just mentioned at Armed Forces Special Management Board at the time, now at USDA APHIS, and I should say slash Smithsonian Institution, because it's in Suitland in the um, Museum Resource Center, um, and and also Andrea Ejizi, which is, um, Andrea runs the only um, county in, in Mammoth County that has a tick-borne diseases program, although now Matt, actually I should say, Matt is just developing one for Bergen County, but uh, for many years, uh, Mammoth County has had a tick-borne diseases program that actually is run at the Center for Vector Biology at Rutgers, 
so between the two of them, Rich basically said, yeah, this is not a species, a U.S. species. And so they went back and forth, trying to identify it. And eventually, Andrea basically used a, a DNA barcoding approach to identify um, the species at, as Hemophasilus longicornis. Then we actually sent this to the um, USDA um, identification lab that then um, uh, James, Bird, uh, James um, Mertens identified it um, as Hemophasilus longicornis. Because it is hard to, to know, even though ticks don't have that many species worldwide, it's still very hard to identify something that is not um, present locally. Uh, this then ended up uh, leading to a interactions with the uh, New Jersey Department of Health, the CDC, Department of Agriculture, USDA, and the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection, which ended up leading to a series of interactions where we have now um, collaborated with the, um, the Northeast Center of Excellence to examine in more detail the phenology biology of, uh, of the Asian longhorn tick. So, and uh, tick control. So Alvaro, um, Matt is a PhD student of Alvaro and they, they're working on understanding better strategies for management and control, looking phonology, Julia, Julia Gonzalez, Dana Price is doing pathogen discovery and Stephanie Aponte is a graduate student looking at tick phonology and behavior. So in, in quickly, because I really want to give time for Matt to get into the detailed IPM, um, Emophagelus longicorn is Newman 1901. Um, is a species that is really native to East Asia, China, North Korea, Peninsula, and Japan. And the 1900s actually be, already was established outside of its native range in Australia and the South Pacific, uh, including New Zealand, because of cattle that was moved, uh, it's taught from Japan to Australia, and then um, the tick moved also with cattle, presumably, uh, to, um, to New Zealand, and then also to some of the South Pacific islands. Um, as mentioned in 2017, this field, pop first population, this field population was first detected in New Jersey. Um, it is a three host tick and it has parthenogenetic population. So far, no males have been found in US and which means that very large infestations can develop from a single individual. Assuming a single individual survives from larva to nymph to adult, um, they can basically start a new infestation even if it's just a larva that gets moved. Um, and I should mention also that um, besides parthenogenetic populations, they also have bisexual populations in, uh, in its native range, only in, in, uh, in its native range. So only in China, Korea, and Japan do we know of, of bisexual populations. Um, the populations in Australia and New Zealand are all parthenogenetic because, again, those are the ones more likely to be able to become invasive. Um, and there's actually even what's so-called aneuploid uh, populations that, so, the bisexual populations are diploid, the parthenogenetic populations are triploid, and there's some aneuploid populations that are neither triploid or, or uh, diploid that um, occur in China and Korea. So it's a, it's a tick with an interesting genetics, it has a broad host range, and in its native range, it is known, and it, that we do know that it transmits quite dangerous pathogens to humans, in particular a virus, uh, they can be deadly to humans, but we actually, it's, it's complicated from the literature to know if it was the diploid form that was, um, that is the primary vector if, or if the parthenogenetic form is involved. So a lot of work needs to be done to really understand some of those details. Uh, I should mention that um, there's a, some useful links here about, you know, biology identification, fact sheets, press releases from all states about first detections and also updated SITRAPs from the USDA are present at this uh, link. Um, we actually did, Andrea Jeezy from Mammoth, uh, because of the complications of people are calling it all sorts of things, actually proposed the Asian longhorn tick as its common name. So this is now the accepted common name uh, applied and accepted by the ESA Committee on Common Names. Uh, it was kind of a complicated discussion on how, why to call it, uh, continue to call it longhorn tick. It does have these spikes on both the, the pulpal, um, Mouth parts also here on the um, in the in the legs. Um, so you ha this is sort of was considered by the original uh, namer as long. Uh, we decided on calling it Asian longhorn tick because here's a the true long long um, horn, uh, which is actually in Hemophasilus uh, juxtacoxi, which is an American South American species, which has been detected um, in Ohio once 
Um, so we are, if the species becomes established, we now know, have a name for it, the American longhorn tick. So that's why we went with Asian longhorn tick. And also that we did publish a detailed pictorial key to differentiate the, the, the Hemophazolus longicornis from all the other Hemophazolus in the United States, which include the, the bird tick Hemophazolus uh, cordialis and uh, the rabbit tick Hemophazolus leporos palustris. Um, and also just the cocci, just for good measure. So um, set of keys. Now, phenology. So the expectation is that from the literature is that um, the primary overwintering stage are the nymphs. So ticks all have, you know, larvae nymphs and adults. Um, the nymph is thought to be the most uh, temp uh, dryness resistant. Um, so if you overwinter as a nymph, you would have the adult come up in the spring which would then lay eggs. You would have larvae in the late summer into the, in the fall. And then again, they would molt into nymphs, which overwinter. In reality, we actually, what sometimes happens is that you see, so in principle, you would only see adults in the early spring, but often we see, and Matt will show you that, we'll see larvae and, um, and we'll see larval nymphs and adults in the spring. So, it's a little unclear if in the Northeast they are overwintering just as nymphs. Most likely they may be overwintering as both nymphs and adults. You could have a, a, a fed larvae potentially uh, overwinter. So we're still a little unclear. In some other parts of its range, including Australia, uh, you do see basically this tremendous amount of overlapping in, in different stages. Um, and that's a little bit of what we see here. So you'll notice so the orange is larvae. We see larvae early in the season. The peak uh, is usually starts out being nymphs. Then you have a smaller peak of adults, and then you have this very large peak of larvae. And again, I refer to you with the data that um, um, Matt will be sending. Now, I see somebody raise their hand. Um, Jaina, can I, what do I do? Oh, we'll just let that go. If, um, if you do have a question, you can pop it into the, the Q&A feature, and then we'll get to it when we have question break. I love hand raising, so hey, all right. So, okay, so this is actually some um, environmental sampling we did very in, in, in 2018. We now have, uh, we've been working on weekly sampling and um, again, Matt will show more details about that. First detections, the first detection in 2018 was in April 14, which is actually one of the first days in, um, in 2018 where the weather was nice and uh, um, Jim Osi and Andrea went out uh, into the original detection site in Hunterton and found already larvae and nymphs. Uh, in 2019, the first detection was in March, and in 2020, the first detection was um, again in March, now early March. These are different locations across New Jersey, all in New Jersey, uh, but we had a very mild, mild winter this year, and that may affect when we do find them first. Um, do, do they are fi primarily found in the ecotone, so this sort of sh longer grass between just on the edges of the forest. This could actually be a path right here, and they often are found on the on the edges of paths. They are on, on primarily on short bushes and grass. We use this uh, tick sweep, which is what uh, Melvin here is demonstrating. So you basically it's basically a, um, a L shaped. Um, system with a, um, a crib flannel, um, um, sort of air uh, cloth um, that is following is modification from Car Carol and uh, Schmidtman, which, however, in their description, they use it as a flag. We actually use it as what we call a sweep because you can walk on the side, and uh, which means you can treat your clothes with uh, insect with repellents and still be able to to sample them. The, the field. We also, um, these ticks don't um, hang on very hard. So we basically check the, the, the sweep every meter, every one or two meters, we check them. Um, the, the ticks are often, so this is uh, what you may not be able to see is this up here is this uh, Asian longhorn just uh, perched on top of this uh, a cattail. So they can be found quite high up in the, in the vegetation. This is a particularly tall vegetation. They would often be found on the on those little tips of the of the grass um, and when they're questing. All right. In terms of the U.S. distribution, it's now known. This is the latest sit rep from the USDA situation report from June 15th. It's found on in 12 states. 
it has a broad uh, set of hosts uh, from um, humans to dogs, cats, coyotes, etc. It is found in large Canada geese. That doesn't seem to be found very often in small birds. At least it hasn't been found in small birds. It, it was found in a red-tailed hawk that, however, was damaged, so it was on the ground. Um, and it is not found, and this has become relevant, Matt will emphasize that again, it's not found in mice. So none of the stages of the, of the species is found on mice. Um, uh, Maria Duke Wasser has been doing a lot of, uh, of searching and uh, they find them very often on um, deer, uh, but not on smaller rodents. Um, Notice the distribution. So here's New Jersey. It's found primarily in the sort of middle um, counties. There's a few sort of very small numbers on the northwest, and we have actually not found it in the in the coastal counties. I mean, that location there in Mammoth is actually on a dog. So when you're looking in the environment, we are not finding it in the environment in the um, southern coastal counties in New Jersey. So it's sort of associated with in, across New Jersey, what we're calling the Piedmont sort of up here, sort of in the mountains as you're going um, south, both sides of the Appalachian. Um, so um, again, not really being found in, in coastal counties across the, the Northeast. We're actually working with Ilya Rushlin to model uh, what is determining the distribution of, of this tick. Um, right. Oh, and I should mention that uh, once people started looking, we actually found um, specimens collected in uh, um, Union County in 2013, or already Asian longhorn ticks. And then um, James Murdens has found that a sample collected in 2010 was already um, the Asian longhorn tick. Actually, and there is a quick question about this map. Someone asked what the different colors refer to. Oh, thank you. Um, so this is, uh, the, the colors are uh, just referred to how the species was identified, how the specimens were identified. So um, the orange means that it was actually done with um, identification by molecular identification and morphological identification. The green is just morphological identification. And I believe the gray is just um, um, genetic identification. So um, I, I've, been, I've been asking actually USDA to change this to um, species identified from the environment versus from a host, but it hasn't happened and maybe it may not happen. Maybe I have to do it myself, but that would have been, I think, a more informative um, way of, of depicting this. But hey, I'm not the one making the map. Um, all right, so any questions? <laughs> I had questions right here. Um, there are actually some people have been putting some really helpful links up there. Nice. Um, and um, Emily's question about who the specialist you referred to earlier, I'll let you answer that in typing later. Um, there's one question before we move on to Matt is um, Emily Dean asked, are larvae active during the winter, thus explaining the high numbers in January 2018? No, and that's actually none, nothing is a, a active during the winter. So basically the populations disappear, quote unquote, from our sampling uh, at the end of October. And then they don't show up again until um, the early spring. So um, this is, um, they, we're actually, one of the projects that uh, is ongoing is trying to understand is there really true diapause? How are they overwintering? Uh, but they certainly, they don't, they don't quest. Um, at least they don't quest in places where we can find them. All right, great. Okay, and there are some other questions that you can probably uh, type the answers to much better than, than verbally uh, with people looking for resources. So, so with that, we'll move on to, uh, to Matt. All right, so um, I wanna uh, thank, uh, thank Jana and Dina for your introductions. Um, I don't think I have, uh, whole lot more to say about myself except I don't really consider myself um, an expert at least not yet um, however I have spent an awful lot of time on this tick um, and so <laughs> I've kind of broken um, my portion of the talk down into the, um, these three categories so um, for Asian longhorn tick management so um, for agriculture um, for protecting our pets and also for protecting um, public health so for agriculture, um, we're primarily concerned with, um, with grazing um, livestock, so cattle, sheep, horses, uh, goats, um, and also um, pigs and deer. Um, so for 
pets. We are primarily concerned with um, with our friends, dogs, and cats. So this is this is our family dog, Baxter, um, and he actually just picked up his first tick last week. Uh, so dogs are just notorious uh, for you know very very uh, ticks are very attracted to them. Um, and then the last area, public health. Obviously, we're we're focusing on humans, um, and in some cases, we are um, we're targeting the environment um, for for that purpose. Um, so overall, um, most of the information, at least worldwide, most of the emphasis has been on agriculture. Um, so the um, the threat of this tick to livestock um, is very costly. Um, so there's been a lot of um, strategies and a lot of research and 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 protecting um, livestock. There's also been a fair amount of work um, protecting pets. There's, um, we know that there's um, materials that are, um, that are highly effective against um, this tick that can be used in pets that we have already registered here in the United States. Um, so what's very, been very lacking is uh, strategies to protect public health. Um, so that's kind of my area of expertise and that's, um, that's, 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 the, um, that's the field that, that I know the most. Um, so if there are really very specific questions um, on agriculture or pets that, that um, I'm not able to answer, I'm sure we can, we can get you in touch with uh, somebody who can. Um, really quick, I just wanted to acknowledge the folks that have been helping me along. Um, Bergen County um, Department of Health Services, Bergen County Mosquito Control, and Rutgers Center for Vector Biology for their support with my ongoing work. And I want to give a, a really a special thanks to um, Dr. Alan Heath from um, Hop Kirk Institute in New Zealand because um, he, he provided just a wealth of information about what's being done in New Zealand, which I'm going to talk to and talk about in a minute. I also definitely want to thank um, Denise Bonilla, Dallas Meek, um, Rebecca Trout Frixel, and Michael Yavsley for uh, providing Dina and I some up-to-date information on what's what's being done about this tick in the U.S. in agriculture right now. So we're going to present some of that information. Also want to thank um, Andrea Jeezy and Alvaro Toledo for their support and the information they provided. Um, so I'm going to talk first about um, New Zealand because um, New Zealand has um, has been managing this tick for more than 120 years, so they have. There's a lot of good information that they've um, that they've produced on this. Um, this tick, it was thought, um, and the earliest records of this tick in New Zealand were around 1894, um, and it was suspected later on that the tick probably um, may have been imported from uh, from livestock from Japan. Um, so. Initially, uh, in the early stages, there wasn't a whole lot being done by the government to, um, you know, to kind of um, reduce the spread of this tick. They, they, initially, they weren't, they weren't very concerned about it. They didn't think it was going to cause problems. But um, a few decades later, uh, farmers were growing increasingly concerned about cattle fever. And they were also noticing that in the northern um, portion of the island, this tick was, um, it was, it was, it was reaching really high numbers. Um, so the farmers were actually putting some pressure on the government and the uh, Ministry of Agriculture um, first started mandating arsenic cattle dips in 1921. So the, um, the ministry um, started constructing these 400 gallon, um, they called them swim dips, and they mixed them with seven pounds of arsenious oxide, which by today's standards sounds extremely toxic, um, but they, this, uh, these arsenic dips were actually, they were touted for having all sorts of other health benefits beyond just, um, beyond just controlling the ticks. So I have no idea what those health benefits were, um, but I'm just happy that today we have, um, we have products that are, that are much safer to use on your animals. Um, so these, um, these dips were to be repeated every three weeks and it was required that the animals get treated before being transported from one quarantine area into another. And there was often, it was often performed before bringing your animal to auction. Um, so around this time also, we start hearing of um, good pasture management being implemented. So in the same way that, you, that there are methods to keep your backyard um, free of ticks, keep it, um, you know, removing brush and, and whatnot, uh, removing tick habitat, you, you can do the same thing on the pasture. And this was, this was actually um, known pretty early on. Um, so some of the, some of the, um, the things that were recommended were plowing your field, um, burning, you know, some of the brush, 
uh, applying a, a top dressing um, of soil in the field to kind of keep the weeds down. And uh, another thing was uh, keeping the pasture free of roughage. So I wasn't entirely sure what was meant by roughage. So I had a, a conversation with Alan Heath about this. And apparently in, um, in New Zealand, um, there are, um, there, there are in pastures, there, there are plants with uh, very low nutritional quality. They're, they're called rushes. And so they're like grassy plants. And so grazing animals will not feed on these plants if they have other food, uh, available to them. So, um, so long as they have other food available to them, these rushes will kind of grow and they'll get very big in the field. Um, and so that's actually creates very good habitat for this tick. Um, so the idea was either burning, removing, chopping down and, and um, getting rid of that, those rushes. Um, so a lot of this uh, information is actually still sort of uh, used today. So this is, this is a, um, one of New Zealand's kind of more current um, management recommendations. So this is a, a calendar and obviously this wouldn't, this wouldn't apply in the United States because the seasons are completely different. Um, but um, but it, they give recommendations on when to treat your cows, um, and a lot of it is actually based on um, pop, on the populations of different stages of the tick. Um, so I'm not going to go through all this, but they also they still there's still an emphasis on keeping the keeping the the grass down, removing debris, um, getting rid of the rush growth. So really keeping that that tick habitat down, um, and in addition to to treating the the, um, the animals, these are really good. Um, tick management recommendations for farms. And I think some of this, um, some of this uh, stuff is, may have to be implemented in the US if this tick continues to, um, continues to spread and cause problems. Um, so um, I'm gonna get into management of Asian longhorn tick in the US. So um, to the best of our knowledge, um, there are no published strategies to control Asian longhorn tick in the US and there are no products specifically labeled for Asian longhorn ticks. And that's across agriculture, um, pets, as well as public health. Um, so I think there are folks, there are folks that are working on this, um, but at the moment we don't have any real strategies. Um, however, we do know that many of our products that we already have labeled for ticks uh, will work. Um, so just um, really quick, the, um, there are um, two types of uh, caricides. Um, that are um, used for, to treat animals for ticks. So we have the caricides that are registered by the EPA as pesticides, and these are usually just topical. So um, materials that go on the outside of the animal's body. We also have a caricides that are registered by the FDA as veterinary drugs. So these include topical as well as oral um, and injections. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, some of these. So the products that are labeled for livestock, they vary by animal type. Um, so, and actually the, the vast majority of, um, of commercial, commercially available products out there are per, uh, permethrin, so pyrethroid. So we have a lot of, a lot of products with permethrin as the active ingredient. Um, we do have um, several other pyrethroids that are used as well as pyrethrins. So that's the sort of the, um, the naturally derived cousins of the pyrethroids. We have a number of organophosphates that are still used in agriculture as well as the um, avermectins. So um, avermectins are uh, a little bit different uh, from these previous ones in that they're not contact uh, poisons, so they don't necessarily kill the ticks outright. They're, they're systemic. We do know that they work um, against Asian longhorn ticks, so Doan Do et al. Um, they actually tested, uh, they actually treated rabbits um, with a number of different uh, avermectins. And they found that um, it was very successful at actually um, reducing the molting success of nymphs and the opposition of adults. So ticks weren't able to survive after being treated. Um, it had, they have also been used um, in field situations to uh, control outbreaks of Tyleri orientalis. So Park et al. Um, describes um, a threefold decrease in infection rate in cattle when used in the field to control Tyleri orientalis. So that's a, a pretty good result. Um, so I have a few resources that I just wanted to um, discuss. So to see what materials are available for use in your state, um, we have this, it's, it's called veterinaryentomology.org slash vetpestx. 
so this is a really nice database that you can you can type in your state, um, type in what animal you're trying to um, trying to protect and um, and what pest. So you're going to type in ticks, and it'll actually um, it'll it'll give you a list of of different products that you can you can use that are registered in your state. Um, the only thing about this list is it doesn't actually include every state, but it has most of the um, most of the bigger livestock states are on there. Um, and then another resource that was shared with us is, um, it's a really good one. This is um, tnticks.org. Um, these are a, num a number of different videos um, that show you how to, how to check animals for ticks. Um, so it kind of gives you, there's a video on um, cattle. So it gives you kind of a step-by-step -step way how to, secure the, how to secure the animal, where to, to start. You're going to check ticks on the ears checking ticks on the legs, checking ticks on the, the tail, and so on. And they have a, another one, I think, for, um, for dogs as well. So it's a really good resource um, to learn how to, um, how to check your animal for ticks. Um, so these are the main modes of application for controlling ticks on livestock. So um, the most common one is, is porons and sprays. Um, the reason why it's most common is because that's it's really easy to do. Um, you're just you're either spraying or you're um, or you're pouring on kind of a measured dose of chemical on that animal, um, and you're treating it. The other um, another one is um, uh, insecticide impregnated ear tags. So there's a few of these that are um, that are labeled for ticks. Um, sometimes they just have a contact toxin in them. Other other times they have both a contact um, and a systemic, um, and then. The last one here, this is um, dips. So these go by a number of different names. I think a, they're called plunge dips or swim dips or saturation baths. Um, it's all the same, kind of the, kind of the same thing. You're actually kind of, uh, you're, you're forcing the animal to kind of dunk itself um, in, in this kind of uh, this bath, um, which contains, um, you know, some uh, acaricide. Um, this is Probably one of the one of the more effective ways to kill ticks uh, because you're actually you're actually able to con to treat the entire uh, body surface of that animal. Um, the only issue with that is it's you know it's an added expense to construct one of these one of these big baths on your farm, um, and it also um, from my understanding is it adds some undue stress to the animal. Um, so it's um, not always um, you know may not be the best approach, but it's, it's certainly maybe one of the more effective at controlling ticks. Um, so, um, so a very significant finding, um, Tyleria orientalis was, um, was implicated in, um, in uh, cat cow mortalities in Virginia. Um, I thought this was, um, this was really interesting. Actually, when, when this, when this first came out, my, my first thought was that, um, this tick we had just that, that we had just discovered its presence in 2017, and already we're seeing that it's transmitting a pathogen that we haven't seen before in the United States. Um, really interesting. Um, it was uh, Asian longhorn ticks that were that were found were found in the area of these cattle that were infected. Um, up to 13% of them were found to be infected with Tyler orientalis. Um, so that's uh, a very um, interesting result. It's not, it's certainly not good news, especially if, if you're, uh, you know, a cattle farmer. Um, but we reached out to, um, f to a number of folks um, at the USDA and um, we were, they, they told us what the, some of these cattle were being treated with. So um, one of the products was gamma cyhalothrin. Um, this was in uh, the commercial formulation was called Stanguard. So that's a product that's, uh, it's actually labeled for lice and horn flies. The reason why they were using this was because we have this reference down here, this Park et al. Um, this paper, it was a, uh, they tested a, a whole suite of different active ingredients against Asian longhorn ticks and gamma cyhalothrin um, came up as one of the most effective. So they were really going for using the most effective product um, to kill these ticks. Um, so one of, the, one of the, the things that I think we need to do um, is we need to work on getting these materials labeled for ticks um, so that they can be used. Um, so we, we obviously want, we want to be able to use the best things that we have, the best tools that we have available. Um, the other thing that they, um, that they use, they use the Doramectin. So that's a, um, that is one of the um, avermectins that I, that I discussed. Um, that's a, a veterinary drug, so it's uh, an injectable. Um, so that's actually labeled for um, internal and external parasites, and it's, uh, it, it is good at killing ticks. 
Um, so I'm going to talk quickly about tick management for pets. Um, so uh, the only real difference here is that we have a few more uh, materials that are available. Um, so 2013, um, we saw the, um, the first of the Isox Azalines. Um, they came out, they're, um, they're really, they seem to be really good. They're broad spectrum, um, they're chewable. So the, the dog or, um, yeah, or, or cat, I guess, um, just has to eat it. And it, they provide up to about 12 weeks of systemic activity um, against ticks. Now what we know um, from this reference here, Toyota et al., um, they tested these against Asian longhorn ticks um, in Japan and um, found that, um, that ticks were, 90% of ticks were controlled on dogs after 114 days. So that's actually almost four months of control that we're actually getting out of it. So really uh, very, seems to be very effective against um, Asian longhorn ticks. Um, the, other, um, the others that we have, we have pyrethroids. Now these are mostly used for dogs. I think we have one um, that can be used for cats, but cats, um, Cats have a harder time metabolizing pyrethroids, so usually a little more toxic to cats. Um, we also have um, fipronil, which is used as a, a topical. Um, sometimes it's like drops that go on, go on the dog's back. Um, that's labeled for dogs and cats, I believe. And then uh, for dogs, we can also use amitraz. So this is a um, this is kind of an older uh, material. It's a um, it's an acaricide. It's very effective at, at killing. Um, it's actually very effective at killing Asian longhorn ticks, and it was used a lot in the 1980s in New Zealand. Um, and that's um, it's mostly used for mange, but we know that it is should be effective against um, Asian longhorn ticks. Um, okay, so this um, I'm going to just quickly uh, share with you this table. This was produced by um, Danae uh, Vaughn and Rebecca Trout Frixel from University of Tennessee. Uh, I really like this table because it, it kind of summarizes a very complicated um, situation. I mean, we have a lot of different active ingredients out here combined with a lot of different um, potential uses for them. Um, so we have, um, we have these, these first four, these, these are um, the Floralaner, uh, uh, Lotolaner, Afoxalaner, and uh, Sarolaner. These are, are those uh, Asexolanines. So these, um, these are only really used for uh, dogs and cats. Um, but we also have Fipronil. We only have uh, one, uh, one pyrethroid that's labeled for cats. And, but we do have a, a few other uh, potential pyrethroids that can be used for dogs. And if you look at um, down this list, we have permethrin. Permethrin is labeled for a whole lot of different livestock uses. Um, and that's one of the, it's one of the major uh, products used for livestock. Um, but again, for livestock, we also have, um, we have a, a few different um, organophosphates that are available. Um, of course, for lactating dairy cattle, we are um, somewhat limited, more limited in what we can use. But for beef and non-lactating dairy cattle, we can use uh, we can use a number of different products. Um, so that's um, that's that's uh, kind of that's the list. I, I am told that this may be a, a partially um, incomplete list, so it might be a little bit abridged. But uh, it's a really good starting point, and this is um, some really good information here. Um, so one thing I. I did want to discuss was the caricide resistance. Um, so uh, as we know, there have around the world, there have, there have been dozens of tick species that have become resistant to uh, acaricides and particularly um, in agriculture, so different species of cattle ticks and so on. Um, so in New Zealand, um, a few years back, there was, um, and you can read about this in Heath and Levitt 2015, they were, uh, they discussed the potential for resistance to occur um, because there was only one compound that was registered uh, for use in dairy cattle and deer. Um, however, they did not detect any resistance and they actually attributed that to, um, to the lifestyle of Asian longhorn tick, being that the cows, the animals are treated themselves and yet this tick most of the time spends, spends most of its time um, off host and in the environment. So the chances of the entire population um, having enough pressure, selective pressure from being treated was they considered it to be fairly low. And that's why they thought resistance hadn't been uh, detected yet. However, resistance did, uh, did occur in Korea. So in Korea, 
um, they were seeing sevenfold increases in the effective doses of cypermethrin that were needed to control Asian longhorn ticks. Um, so resistance, we know from that, we know resistance is, is possible. We certainly want to have multiple um, modes of action uh, available. Um, the, the difference here is, um, and this is kind of just speculation, but um, in Korea, we do have um, both bisexual and parthenogenic parthenogenetic strains of this tick. Um, and whereas in New Zealand, we have only the par parthenogenetic strain. Um, so there's it's possible um, that uh, there could be um, a, more a greater chance of mutation um, uh, because of the recombination with a, a bisexual strain. That resistance uh, development might be a little bit, um, might be a little bit easier. But again, that's, that's kind of just speculation. But it's it's definitely interesting to think about. Um, so I'm gonna uh, open it up for some questions, if there are any. Uh, yep, there are. Um, Mark Lasher asked, does selamectin work against ticks? Um, selamectin, um, most likely, but uh, I, don't, I don't have any specific uh, information about that, at least with, uh, as, it, as it relates to Asian longhorn ticks. Okay. Um, and, um, uh, Eric uh, Dotseth said, are you finding Asian longhorn tick closer or further from human population centers? That's a very good question. I, I like that question. So, um, and I'm going to, I'm going to actually address that in a little bit more detail when I, when I move on. But um, we're, so we're here in Bergen County and this is a, we have a population here is about a million people. And as Dina can probably attest, we have a really high population of Asian longhorn ticks right here. Um, so we're seeing them in, in small um, kind of city parks. Um, so yes, we're definitely seeing high populations very close to humans. Um, and it's my understanding that we also uh, do see high populations on, on certain cattle farms, so kind of more rural areas. Um, but yes, we, we, do, we do find them close to humans. Okay, great. And um, we have some other questions, but I'm gonna leave them until the end of your uh, presentation because you may cover some of them as we go sure. on. Sure, okay. All right, so now I'm going to get into to the, the final topic, which is public health control of Asian longhorn ticks. And um, right off the bat, um, I'm, you know, we know uh, the best way to, um, to avoid getting bitten is to take pre uh, you know, pr protective measures. Um, so um, Foster et al. Um, tested um, the six of the CDC um, recommended um, insect repellents. Um, so we have deep Bicaridin IR3535, oil of lemon eucalyptus, paramethane diol, and 2-undecanone. And um, they tested them against Asian longhorn ticks, and they, they found that all these products showed 93 to 97% repellency um, over a period of 30 minutes. And I think repellency was, um, was measured as the percentage of ticks that were, that were repelled from that material. They also tested uh, permethrin impregnated fabric and they found that um, it repelled 96% um, of Asian longhorn ticks in three minutes. Um, so we know that, now we know that uh, a lot of the protective measures that we already have, that we're already using, are quite effective against Asian longhorn ticks. And I think probably the, the, the trick is just getting people to use them. Um, the next thing um, is I wanna just touch touch base really quick on wild host targeted control. So this is a method of tick management that, that is used um, uh, particularly against our native species of ticks. So uh, black-legged ticks um, as well as lo uh, lone star ticks. Um, and some of these, um, including these, um, these uh, rodent uh, bait uh, tubes, um, which, um, you know, which are, which are used successfully against um, black-legged ticks in, in mice. Um, we know that things like this probably won't work because as Dina just mentioned, um, a, uh, Asian longhorn ticks do not like to feed on mice. Um, mice are not, we're not really seeing them on mice in, in the US at least. Um, however, the four poster uh, stations which are used for um, deer, um, those might actually provide control but there is uh, certainly research on that and is definitely lacking. Um, so now I'm going to um, get into a, a little bit of my research. Um, I spent spent a, a few weeks over the winter looking. I was I was I was looking for 
um, F for field efficacy trials um, using a caricides against Asian longhorn ticks. And um, this is what I came up with, came up with two papers. Um, so not a whole lot. Um, they were both completely in Japanese. So I had to, I had to, uh, I had Google Translate had to read them to me. Um, but um, what, what I kind of figured out what, what they did and what these guys, they used, um, they used a number of um, organophosphates. Um, they also used uh, an organophosphate mixed with a, a pyrethroid tetramethrin. And that was actually, um, that, that mixture was actually the most, uh, the most effective at controlling ticks. So they were able to achieve um, about 100% control for about six days. And ticks returned after that period of time, um, but they never, they never returned to pre-treatment levels after that. But they, they sampled for about 45 days, so they didn't sample for the entire season. Um, so they, they used, um, they made one application and they did this um, in kind of in the, in the spring, I think. Um, so we wanted to do something a little bit different. We wanted to, we wanted to actually use um, a, single, a single product, single uh, a caricide that we knew would be effective, uh, but we wanted to figure out the ideal time of year to spray. So we based that on um, the, diff the abundance of the different life stages. Um, so this is uh, this is uh, just a picture of a park where I, I did this work. Um, it's a um, it's a pretty small park. It's only about 12 acres. It's along the Hackensack River. This is in northeastern New Jersey, and it's right behind a shopping mall. And I spend I admit I spend probably way too much time at this park because this park has uh, a really high Asian longhorn tick population, um, and we've been working on um, quantifying that. Um, so in 2019, I set up these um, 10 of these 30-meter uh, transects, and I started sampling these uh, at the end of April into um, the end of October, so about six months of sampling. And I used a, a small sweep. Um, so Dina had shown you some image, some pictures of a sweep. The sweep that I used was, uh, it's about the size of maybe your computer screen. Um, and I had to uh, check the sweep um, frequently. So every, every three meters. So this tick is a little bit different from um, some of the species that we are used to sampling in that they tend to fall off of sweep uh, of sweeps and, uh, and drags more frequently. So instead of uh, for, for black legged ticks, you could get away with um, checking every 12 meters or so. For this tick, you definitely want to check more often in order to get an accurate sample. Um, this is just a picture of the, the sampling area. So it's, it's ecotone. Uh, primarily, so very uh, kind of weedy, um, higher grass, and what we're finding is that this tick, um, this tick likes to, they like to quest up to up to um, 30 centimeters or so. This is a picture here of uh, about a dozen ticks kind of crammed together on uh, the end of a, a, a piece of grass. Um, this it was, this is not, um, this is not unusual to see this. I mean, this is a very common sight, and actually, we we are seeing that it, it is common for multiple ticks to kind of cluster together um, in one spot for some reason. Um, this, is, this is just the raw data from 2019. Um, so here um, we have in yellow, we have the nymphs. In red down here, we have the adults. And in blue, we have the larvae. So um, this, um, this, is actually, this is a lot of nymphs. We had a couple thousand nymphs. We had uh, several hundred adults, and we had just a really unreasonable number of larvae. Um, it's a really high larval population, and um, it peaked right here on, on September 17th. Um, and that was, a, that was really a rough day, but we, we got through it. Um, I took that same data, and I just uh, converted it into pr proportion of activity, so I could, I could kind of show you where, the, um, where each life stage kind of peaks. Um, so again, in yellow is the nymphs, um, in red is the adults, and in blue is the, that's that larval population. So the, um, the nymph, we, one of our caricide treatments was during the, the peak nymphal population. So that was, um, that was in early June. The second one was during the adult population. So the peak was in, uh, right in the middle of July. And our last application, um, that was that was during the very, kind of the very beginning of that larval population, at the end of the, the adults and the beginning of the larval population. Um, and like I, like I mentioned, we wanted to use a, a material that, um, that we had a 
uh, that we were pretty confident would give us a, a decent control. So the product we picked was Lambda Cyhalothrin. Um, and this reference here, Lee, they, um, they actually uh, measured the, um, the uh, residual um, activity against NIMS. And so they were getting about 50% 50, 50 control of NIMS after 28 days. So it's a relatively long um, residual activity. Um, so this is the same, the same uh, transect map, but these are our treatments kind of defined. So we have um, in blue, we have our June application and we're targeting the nymph population. In yellow, we have the uh, July application that we're targeting that peak adult population. And in August, um, we're targeting that late adult and that early, very early larval population. And then we have our last treatment, which was the sequential application on, on all three dates, where we're actually targeting all three stages. And then we have our untreated controls. Um, so here I'm showing, um, and I apologize because these are, the graphs look a little bit busy, um, but I'm, I'm showing you, um, on top, I'm showing you the, uh, one of the untreated plots. On the bottom, I'm showing you one of the treatment plots. And on the left axis, we have, that's adults and nymphs per square meter. And on the right axis is uh, larvae per square meter. And you'll notice that the larval scale is about 100 times more than the scale for the adults and nymphs. Um, so for our June application, that happened right here on this, this green line. So we achieved a very good control, 100% control for 42 days. Um, so that was kind of unexpected. Um, didn't really know how long it would last, but there were no ticks in, in these treated plots for six weeks. Um, however, what you'll notice as the season went on, um, that application didn't seem to have any real effect on the, uh, the adult population that followed, nor on that huge larval population in the fall. Um, so this was our, our next treatment was, this was the July treatment. So we treated right here, right, right, at, right during that peak adult population. And we had a similar result, 100% control for 35 days. But what you'll notice as the season progressed, um, that larval population was, was much smaller than it was in the untreated plots. So there was, it actually wound up being a 75% reduction in the larval population. So that was a good kind of an interesting result. Um, but by far our most effective treatment was this treatment in August. So we applied right here, just as we were starting to, starting to see larvae um, and kind of as the adults were on the decline. And we had 100% control for seven weeks. So a really long period of, of control for this tick. We started to see ticks here. Um, these were mostly larvae and you can't see it in this graph because the scale is so big. Um, but you'll notice uh, importantly over the, the rest of the season, the larval population never really developed. So single digit numbers of larvae um, for the rest of the season. So really good results um, in control. And I think it was, it was about 99.8% control of that larval population. Um, so a really good result. And this was our, this is when we spray on all three dates. Um, so we were treating in June, um, July and August. And this, this actually gave us for the, for the season following treatment, we had a 99.9% .9 control of the entire population. So our conclusions, um, Lambda Cyhalothrin was highly effective against Asian longhorn ticks in the field. Um, foliar applications of Lambda Cyhalothrin can control 100% of Asian longhorn ticks for up to seven weeks in the environment. Um, again, the June application, it, it definitely provided control of the nymphal stage, but it didn't have any real effect on the subsequent adult and larval populations. Our July application actually provided 75% control of the fall larval population, which was really uh, one, of, one of the main goals was to prevent that, that huge larval population that we saw. Um, and then the August population reduced all stages of Asian longhorn ticks by 99.8% from August through October. Um, and the three, the three applications uh, sequentially reduced the population by 99.9%. .9 and I have this uh, little asterisk here um, that, um, we think ticks uh, that, were, that we found in the plots later on were, were reintroduced from wildlife. And we think that kind of explains why we have such a long period of control. Because instead of, because in addition to the residual activity of that, of that application, we also had to wait, wait for ticks to actually molt. So that incubation period could be several weeks long. And we think that added to that long, that long lasting effect. Um, so these are just really, really quickly, just plans for the season. Um, my, my goal was to um, evaluate potentially more 
um, selective application methods. Um, so in this case, granule versus, versus liquid. Um, we think um, granules um, should be a little bit more of a, um, a little, little bit more of a selective um, application method because we're, we're treating the ground. We're treating the, the ground surface where the ticks are as opposed to the plants themselves where there's many other um, arthropods all over those plants. And that's what this picture is in here. This, this, uh, these are monarch butterflies in one of the plots. Um, so we certainly want to avoid uh, non-target um, impacts. And I also am evaluating insect growth regulators. So there are um, these two products, Novaluron and Pure Proxifen. They, we have them, they're labeled for ticks already, um, but we, we want to evaluate them against Asian longhorn ticks and see what the result is. And so we're going to, um, everything that we do this season, we're also going to repeat it in the laboratory um, in the fall to kind of validate those results. Um, so are there, are there any questions? Sorry, there are some questions. Okay. Um, actually, two people asked a very similar question. Mm -hmm. um, what did the, what, um, have you looked at the following spring? So one person said, uh, what did the following spring look like after the August treatment? And Eric Foster said, do you plan to repeat the control study looking at effects over next year's um, cohort of ticks? Seems like if you suppress uh, larvae significantly, you'd see subsequent reductions in the next year. Yeah, these these are these are really good questions, and we had the we actually had the same questions early on in the season. And so, what we found was um, is interesting. And I I didn't share the data because I, I was kind of constrained for time, but we did see significantly fewer ticks in areas that were treated um, in the spring compared to the untreated controls. Um, so that effect actually lasted up until about maybe May. Um, so yes, we do see suppression of ticks following. Uh, the following year from sprays that occurred as much as and it was a, it was as far as 10 months so there are actually there are actually fewer ticks in the spring um, in plots that were treated in june the previous year than there were in the untreated plots so i don't have a really good explanation for why um, control lasted um, that long but it did so the you know that th looking at that needs to be repeated um, but ultimately um, because there's so many ticks in this park there's a lot of wildlife in this park um, by about um, early to mid-May, the tick population in, in every single plot kind of returned to its normal levels. Um, so at, at this time, there's no significant difference in any of those plots. Okay. All right. Um, some, and then there are two questions um, on a further similar product. Uh, so someone said, do you think a higher rate of lambda would have, would have provided extended control? The use rate was the lowest label rate. Um, so what we had gone, actually gone with the highest label rate for um, labeled for ticks in turf. So there are higher higher label rates, but I I didn't want to use them because uh, for that for that product those higher label rates were for um, treating perimeters of buildings, um, not for actually treating vegetation. So yeah, we actually did use the highest rate, but that's a, that is a really good point, and I, I would I would kind of um, I would say on on the other hand, could we have could we have uh, had quite as good control if we had lowered the rate. Um, so that's, that's a really good question. And um, I, I, don't, I don't have the answer to that because we didn't do it. Uh, but. Okay. All right. And um, there is one last question from John Gelhouse, which I think we have a minute to answer. How specific is uh, lambda to ticks and mites, or does it affect um, insect populations? Yeah, so, so lambda cyhalothrin, it, it, it's a pyrethroid and it's, it's very broad spectrum. Um, so it, it, it'll kill most everything, I think. Um, yeah, and that's, that's, that's kind of the, the thing in, in tick control is we have a lot of broad spectrum products out there that are labeled for ticks. We don't have, a lot, we don't have very many narrow spectrum things that we can use, especially in the public health arena. Um, so that's, that's an, a direction that I think we want, should focus our research on. Great. All right. So we uh, there's a, a, a main takeaway that we're going to cover, and then we have some things to end. And there's two other questions that are left open. Uh, if we have time at the end, we'll get to those. And if people who are on the on the call um, have answers to those questions, feel free to, to dive in there. So Dina, I think you're next. Yes. Uh, um, actually, one thing that happened is that we skipped um, uh, three slides of mine. Um, and I just, because it's, it summarizes, uh, if I may, 
Um, I'm going to go back. Uh, hold on. <laughs> Let me go back to the slides. Here we are. Um, can I go back? Yes, I can. All right. Oh, actually, it's right here because it's mine. Um, here we go. So I just wanted to summarize sort of the good news. No human pathogens have been detected so far in U.S. populations of this tick. Asian longhorn ticks are not capable of transmitting the Lyme bacterium, and all the references are back here. You'll have access to this slide. Um, compared to local black-legged ticks and lone star ticks, Asian longhorn seems to be uninterested in humans, and so these con conversations about um, are they close to humans? Yeah, they are. Um, they are all over the Rutgers campus also. So. Um, they are in grass, and so uh, even, even in clip grass, they, the, the larvae can occur. Um, but standard tick repellents and acaricides are effective, as Matt just mentioned. Now, the bad news, um, Pat already covered the fact that they have been found infected with filaria, um, and, so, and this was only the only tick that was found infected with that particular pathogen, so uh, although other ticks were present. Um, and they are also capable of being shown to be capable of transmitting rickettsia rickettsia in the laboratory, uh, which this is the Rocky Mountain spotted fever agent. Um, and they can reach extraordinarily high numbers in the fall, which is why they were detected. I mean, this lady that first consulted with TOG, literally she had hundreds of larval ticks all over their clothes. So um, there was also some initial alarm signs. We we're a little concerned and, and uh, Matt and Alvaro just published a paper on this. Matt was bit by larval um, longhorn, Asian longhorn ticks. Uh, they're about 100th of an inch, little cute little fellows. Um, he was a little puzzled, uh, actually curious to see if they would bit him. And so he actually drove an entire hour watching a uh, larval tick kind of starting to bite him. Um, that's, that's the kind of magnification to be able to see it. And turns out that they actually had been bit by multiple, like seven or eight different larval ticks. And he had about two weeks of, uh, of a pruritic um, lesion after that. So again, sort of the, the, the clouds are rumbling and we really need to be able to do something about it. And as mentioned, um, although we know that the native species of ticks are still the biggest source of risk to residents, uh, and that the same measures that prevent tick bites from native species can and should be used against the uh, Asian longhorn ticks, um, the high numbers may panic the residents. And so, uh, and the association with livestock may increase biting risk. So if you're someone that handles cattle, uh, there's some evidence from um, the East Asia that you may be more likely to be bit. Um, and of course, we have sort of possibility of changes in behavior associated with this new environment. Um, which could involve local pathogens. And so we're concerned. We're concerned that these are large populations. And uh, um, so we need new strategies for prevention, early detection, and some enlightened control. We all had conversations over the Q&A about what would be alternatives. Uh, Matt mentioned that there's a, just a few different uh, acaricides. Most of them are not specific, although I was happy to see those monarch butterflies showing up in the sites that he had treated last year. So like he's doing, trying to figure out what's the best timing to be able to apply um, uh, control approaches and come up with alternatives, you know, the ways of controlling on host, figuring out what are the primary hosts. These are all important um, things to do. And so I just want to go through um, to the last slide. Um, so I just went through all of Matt's talk really quickly. And so here's the, sorry, the my main takeaways. Preventing other invasive ticks is really important. The risk to agriculture is real. Agricultural APM is still being developed as, as Matt went to pains to sort of be able to explain and summarize. Products need to be evaluated and ALT needs to be included on labels. That's part of the problem And some of the products that are known now to work are actually not actually specifically labeled for ticks. And they don't need to be specifically labeled for Asian longhorn ticks, just need to be labeled for ticks. Products for IPM on pets do exist. However, specific testing for the US strains of Asian long, longhorn ticks may be a good idea. And then um, current public health risk is minimal compared to endemic species. But what we've tried to use is use some of the sort of hype associated with an invasive tick to try and make the public aware of the need to uh, pr protect themselves against other, any tick. Um, and so the risk of the ticks presence 
can be upsetting to existing IPM, but can also be used as a strategy to um, enhance uh, the messaging for um, native species and uh, of ticks and native reasons why the public should be um, taking care of, of themselves. And that's my last slide. Thank you. Great, lovely, thank you. And if you could move it forward to the next slide, that would be great. Okay, and so we want to um, uh, end as we began with some questions for you. Uh, um, and the same, the same questions of uh, how knowledgeable uh, you consider yourself to be around this topic. That was a very informative uh, presentation, so thank you. And uh, again, no right answers, no wrong answers, just, um, just uh, share what's there for you and, um, and we'll share the results um, at the end. Um, and I'll give you a couple of minutes to do that, so thank you. And actually for the presenters, there's a couple of interesting questions that have just come in on the Q&A, so maybe you might want to use this time for uh, looking at those. Yep, I'll do that. Um, just looking through the questions. I mean, there's one, one interesting one. Are dips, are dips baths more problematic for the environment because you need to mix up, uh, you know, hundreds of gallons of um, formulated product and then what do you do with it? Um, that's, a really, that's a really good question. I, I don't have a great answer for it, only that uh, I imagine that yes, probably is. Because um, what do you do with all the, um, what do you do with all that material when you're done with it? Well, on the other hand, it's localized. So you, you have it in a contained area. And so that's true. You're not spreading it all over the pasture. So the <laughs> problem, though, is that a lot of these, and I answered a question earlier about are there alternatives? Can you do rotation? Can you, you know, sort of, but the problem with these three host ticks, like the Asian longhorn tick, is that even they, they will latch on to um, any rodent, or I'm sorry, not rodents, uh, any other animal in the area. So they're not only dependent on cattle. So uh, pasture rotation will not work for these kinds of, of ticks, unfortunately. All right, so I think we have almost 70% 70 uh, 70 of people have responded to the poll. So we will close that up and share the results with you. So, all right. So we've had a significant shift in people from um, not at all knowledgeable or somewhat into very knowledgeable. And uh, the same with the other questions. Um, moving into moderately and very knowledgeable. So that tells me that, um, that this was a very helpful uh, presentation. Um, the thing that we love to hear is um, the results of this webinar, how likely are you to increase your implementation of IPM? And 48% uh, of people said um, they were very likely and 10 extremely likely and 27 moderately likely. So that's really uh, great news because that's what we like to see. Um, so if you could move to the next slide for me, please, Dina. Uh, we have on our um, we have on our website as a find a colleague. So, uh, for example, if you are um, a researcher or a farmer um, who is interested in working with uh, Dina and Matt, you can put a profile up on this site. It's a way for um, folks in the in, in the northeast who are interested in finding each other. Uh, can connect and you can put a profile up here. I actually don't know if uh, Dina and Matt are there yet, but I'm sure they'll put their profile up. So it's a way just of uh, people being able to uh, connect with each other um, to find uh, folks to work with on IPM uh, research. And next slide. We have um, some uh, remaining uh, webinars coming up. I won't read all of these off, uh, but you can go to our website and you'll see the list of the upcoming uh, TIC uh, webinars. I think we're looking at an eighth webinar too, which isn't listed here yet. Uh, so do come back and check on that. Uh, the next one is by Alison Gardner from the University of Maine. And she's going to be talking about habitat management for vector-borne diseases. Um, so actually, I know somebody was uh, asking about that to today on, on the webinar. So that would be a great one for, for you to come to. Next slide. Um, as I mentioned, the recording will be available next week. You'll get an email from me with a copy of the recording. And next slide. And finally, we just want to acknowledge our funder, which is uh, the USDA NIFA program. Um, they fund the Northeastern IPM Center. They fund researchers uh, like uh, Matt and Dina to do their work. 
and uh, without uh, your tax dollars and USDA getting uh, the set aside for funding, uh, this would not happen. So um, I want to acknowledge and thank them and acknowledge and thank uh, Dina and Matt for all of the years in, of education and hours of, <laughs> of late nights and hard work that has gone into being able to sit here in an hour and a half and share all this amazing information. So thank you for, thank you for all of that. So. All right, so with that, I will conclude the presentation and say thank you and thank you for your great questions and your interest in this topic. Okay, bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.